Circle Ecolai Dust Conference. And together with all of you, we're looking forward to a splendid week of discussions, conversations, dialogues about what might be the future of particle physics. And as you have observed outside, uh, I think we will be accompanied this week by the typical Belgian weather as well. <laughs> Additionally, on the square in front of the hotel, you might have noticed the exhibition, The Code of the Universe. This open air exhibition aims to bring or science or technology to society. And I would say in this case, it brings science and society uh, and technology to effectively, explicitly, the people in the street. On the agenda of the week, you have a lineup of plenary talks, parallel sessions, covering all aspects of the FCC study revolving around the physics, the experiments, the machine design, the technologies, the infrastructure and the civil engineering. And as a highlight, a dedicated session uh, is scheduled on the important economical dimensions of the study. And not to forget the other highlight, which is related to the final report of the Horizon 2020 Eurocircle Design Study, essential in our endeavor of preparing the future. I have no doubt that the impressive schedule this morning for the opening session uh, triggered your attention and interest. We have a lineup of the leading minds in science, technology, and policymaking. And for the first welcome address, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the stage Dr. Wolfgang Butcher, who is since about 10 years the Deputy Director General for Research and Innovation in the European Commission. Please. Director General Zanotti, President Van der Rompuy, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is a great pleasure for me to be able to join you today to launch the 2019 Future Circular Collider Week. You are all scientists, all connected to the scientific world and supporting it, so no need for me to tell you how important fundamental science is for pushing forward the boundaries of human knowledge in all fields. Let me assure you that the European Commission believes strongly in the role of science in our societies and will continue to defend the role of basic research. Without fundamental research, applied research is not possible. One can only apply what has already been conceived. Fundamental science enable, enables us to redefine concepts, to see the world and ourselves from a new perspective. You have been working for some years now on the design of the future circular collider. You are presenting this week the different elements of your design study. This is a major venture and we are still in the early phases of what will come next in the world of physics. You will be able to describe collectively this roadmap via the update of the European strategy for particle physics, which was recently launched. The European Commission has supported the various scientific communities present here today. The Horizon 2020 Research Infrastructure Program has funded the Euro Cir Circular Collider Project and supported the accelerator and detector communities, which are also connected to the future circular collider efforts via ARIS and the AIDA 2020 project. We have also supported this initiative to the Maria Sklodowska Curie program, another part of Horizon 2020. This program has supported the training of PhDs in superconductors and refrigeration and cooling, cooling infrastructures via East Train 
In fact, the program has invested over 72 million euros in training researchers in the area of particle, nuclear, and high energy physics. If you look at how large scale facilities participate in the Maria Sklodowska Curie actions, CERN and DESI are respectively the second and third recipients preceded only by MBIT. We have also supported the initiative the Europe through the European Research Council, which is, as you know, funds, which provides, as you know, funds for individual researcher initiated projects. In this framework, 553 grants has been attribute, have been attributed through its panel fundamental constituents of matter for a total amount of almost 1 billion euros. And in fact, two members of the Future Circular Collider Scientific Program Committee have been ERC grantees. European research funding has been a strong force in coordinating and consolidating the European R&D efforts and communities. The European Research Council and the mission-oriented efforts have brought new styles of governance and are having an influence in basic research funding across all member states in general. And Horizon Europe, our next framework program for research and innovation, will of course also have a pillar devoted to excellent basic science, including research infrastructures, Maria Sklodowska Curie, and the European Research Council. This part of Horizon Europe will be funded, we hope, with almost 26 billion euros. As you know, the substance has been already agreed between the European Parliament and the Council, but the amounts available for this funding program depend on the overall agreement of heads of states regarding the next multi-financial framework for the European Union. One proof that we are committed to fundamental science is the increase for the European Research Council by 3.6 billion euros compared to the current budget period. This is at least the proposal of the European Commission. At the same time, it is vital that we harness all our efforts in the European Union and globally to help provide answers to the social, economic and ecological challenges the planet is facing. Only by bringing together all our resources can we hope to avert a crisis. It has been said that the next decade will not be like any other we have experienced up to now. Nor, if we fail to act, like any that follows it. This places a great respons responsibility on all of us to show how we can contribute and adapt our tools and our ways of working and of thinking so we can have a maximum impact. That will be the driving force behind the future European program for research and innovation and many other programs at the European level. We very much look forward for working with you on these challenges and to supporting you as we have done in the past. You are essential for helping us to shape our understanding of the world and future societies. I wish you an excellent week in Brussels. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for this warm and supportive welcome address and I would say now from the, the challenges of policy making to the uh, challenges of scientists and so to the stage or director general of CERN, Dr. Fabiola Gianotti. Please. Good morning. I'm 
very pleased to have the opportunity to say a few words in the uh, opening session of the of this SCC week in the presence of uh, President uh, Van Ampoy and other Dr. Buscher and other authorities. Um, I would like to uh, immediately to uh, um, acknowledge and, and thank the organizers of this week. Actually, most of the work is done <laughs> the week before. Uh, so in particular, Michael, uh, Michael Benedict, uh, Johannes Wittreberg, and uh, Jorgen Dons and their, and their team. Now, if I look back at, the, uh, at last year's uh, SEC week in, uh, in Amsterdam, clearly enormous progress has been made. Uh, a big milestone, uh, the uh, conceptual design report, the CDR has been met. This is a document, you know, a four volume document submitted as an input to the European Council of State for practical feedback. Uh, I must say that that document uh, really uh, reflects a project that is quite mature already at this stage, with a um, uh, deep exploration of the physics uh, potential, the great physics potential and physics program, in particular, particularly rich and compelling for what we call the integrated program, the baseline, first uh, plus or minus collider, uh, followed by, by other collider. Um, with a credible and realistic layout of the various machines option and realistic uh, parameters, with a deep understanding of the technical challenges, but also with a clear view of the uh, R&D work that is needed in order to uh, accomplish the, the project. So what is the next step? As you know, we are all very much uh, engaged in the um, update of the European strategy for particle physics. The deliberation are expected at the end of January 2020 and the Council will, uh, will endorse the, the strategy in, in May. As I have uh, mentioned several times, uh, I think it's important that uh, the strategy gives a clear indication about the future collider in Europe at CERN linear, between linear uh, and circular. Uh, this is very important in order to be able to focus our efforts, to focus our resources, and to do uh, the necessary preparation work to possibly start construction of the next facility before the end of the next decade, so that this facility can run in the early 40s, so that the gap between the end of Illuminos DRHT and beginning of the next facility is minimized. And the preparatory work to be done uh, until the end of the uh, mid, uh, sorry, mid end of next decade, so by the next update of the European strategy around 2026, is really uh, broad and difficult and challenging. So it's of course financial work, funding, uh, having a scheme for funding the next facility because the next facility cannot be funded fully from the CERN budget. It requires funding from other sources. So a lot of creativity and uh, you know, new paradigm also from the point of view of funding. It will be geological and civil engineering work. It will be administrative work because building a big collider in a highly populated region like the Geneva region and uh, France Voisine is not obviously not, not obvious. It will require technical work, of course, from the machine and, uh, and uh, physics uh, exploration work. It will require communication work. It's very important to uh, you know, get the support of the public, get the support of the authorities and politicians and get the support, which is perhaps the most difficult thing of times from other disciplines. So we should be, you know, be able to communicate the excitement for the physics role and also for the technologies that we are going to develop and their impact on society. And there will be a lot of preparatory work to build a global project. We are, of course, used to international projects. DRHT is an international project. The SEC collaboration, Michael will show it later on, is, a, is an international, has a uh, strong international support. But uh, the realization of such a project re requires really a new governance, a new global governance, and we have to start to think about it. Okay, so these are general terms. Let's now assume for a moment, at least for this week, that the European strategy will recommend SEC. So if you recommend click, you can go home and so let's assume that it will be SEC. And now what I will say is in the framework of SEC. Of course, at face value, SEC looks mission impossible. It's a daunting project, it's a scary project, pretty much like DRHT in the mid 80s. People were scared about it, took the thought it will never ever happen. 
However, mission has been accomplished, and you know very well, the LHT, in terms of accelerators, experiments, and computing, has overperformed. There is essentially no single parameter where we have not done better than the field. So this speaks, of course, to the competence, to the dedication of the, of the community. Uh, also, the project is daunting. However, let me stress that the only way for humanity to push back the limit of knowledge and to make great progress is through difficult, um, challenging, and brave initiatives. Uh, the knowledge of hum uh, humanity needs brave projects and brave people. I was, in, um, I was in London a few weeks ago and I visited the Science Museum. And one of the fantastic objects they had there, I don't know if you have been there, is the capsule of the Apollo 10. So you go there, you expect something super high tech, and you see a little object, half of this podium, not really high tech, almost uh, I don't know, scotch tape almost, and you say, I will never ever put my finger into it. And three brave people gone into this thing and accepted to be thrown in outer space without knowing if they will come back. So this is really how humanity goes, moves forward, and how the knowledge of humanity is uh, pro progressing. We need brave projects and we need brave people. And I think we are brave people because we are not, because we are not scared by, by, uh, by challenges. Now, let me say that uh, if I look at the FCT, without being too arrogant, I think that perhaps the best place, not perhaps, without perhaps, the best place to realize it is at CERN and in Europe. Of course, with the strong collaboration of partners from all over the world. So why at CERN and in Europe? Because in Europe we have the expertise uh, that we have developed over years of uh, activity uh, in this field. We have uh, the knowledge, we have the infrastructure, because no lab in the world has the uh, accelerator infrastructure and other infrastructure, technical infrastructure as, as CERN has, but also because we have the values. We have the values of open science, accessible to everybody. We have the values of sharing knowledge. We have the values uh, of global collaboration. And we have been trained in working in this, with these values now for, for decades. Um, if I look back at the origin of CERN, you all know that CERN uh, was founded in 1954. Um, following the, the push and the initiatives of um, visionary scientists and politicians with a twofold goal on one end of, bring, of bringing back scientific and research excellence in Europe after the war, many, many brains had migrated in, uh, in other uh, regions of the world, but also to promote uh, peaceful collaboration among European countries after the, disasters, uh, after the disasters of the war. So those people understood that science and research is the foundation of economic uh, development, of progress, and of peaceful collaboration. So I think that over the decades, well, I think our, our, uh, our uh, founding fathers will be very proud to see what CERN has become 50 years later, what we have done in science, and what we have done in promoting peace, not only in Europe, but also across uh, the world, and bringing together people from, from all countries. So I think that it's very important that we maintain in Europe a prominent role in fundamental science, the role that we have played now over the decades, a prominent role in fundamental science and a prominent role in, in the values of humanity. So um, I think, I hope that this week will be um, another step forward toward this goal and I wish you very fruitful meetings and, um, and discussions. Thank you. Fabiola for this very uh, welcoming address and with a, a clear enthusiasm for the project in front of us. We've heard that collaborations across borders is essential for major scientific projects. Along these lines, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker. It would take another keynote talk to walk you through the political career and the achievements of Herman van Rompuy. 
Educated in applied economics, he was the Belgian Minister of Budget in the 90s. And earlier this century, he was the president of the Belgian Chamber of Representatives. Maybe more importantly, that after a political crisis in Belgium in 2007, 2008, Herman van Rompuy was asked by the, the Belgian king to become the prime minister of Belgium and to bring in political stability. Shortly after, he was unanimously elected as the first president of the European Council, in brief, the president of Europe. He was praised as a consensus builder in sometimes seemingly impossible situations. President Van Rompuy was re-elected for a second term, which closed at the end of 2014. Consensus building is vital as well among scientists, especially towards, as I mentioned, major and global research infrastructures. Together with you, I'm looking forward to his keynote. And without any further ado, let us welcome the President Emeritus of the European Council and the former Prime Minister of Belgium, Herman van Rompuy. Madam Director General, ladies and gentlemen, don't expect a scientific uh, speech from me. Uh, so I will speak in general terms about the European Union, situation in the world, trying to draw the bigger picture in which you live and in which you work. What is the state of the Union? Where are we headed? First of all, let's say the the more general uh, context. In the midst of growing so-called Euroscepticism, a surprising phenomenon occurs. Support for EU membership has never been greater for 27 years, especially among youngsters. A continuously increasing majority, 62% even, of Europeans think that being a member of the EU is a good thing for their country and for themselves. Only 11% thinks it's a bad thing, 62 against 11. 75% of euro area citizens are in favor of the euro, the highest level since the introduction of the euro. Because this, is a, this has a negative argument. An exit such as Brexit has created such an aversion for additional instability in the EU 27, that the EU is now seen as an anchor of stability. People, it is as simple as that, do not want to add instability to a world they already experience as sufficiently unstable. Anti-European parties, by the way, are no longer in favor of leaving the European Union, of an exit. Their ambition is to block and destroy the functioning of the European institutions as much as possible from within, instead of leaving the European Union. Why? Because the vast majority of citizens are against exit, as I said. Populists have had to change their strategy. A populist wants to be popular. That does not mean that a popular person is a populist. Ladies and gentlemen, analyzing the European elections reveals positive and negative points. On the positive side, a sharp rise in participation rate in elections, that's a positive evolution from 43% to 51%. Many American presidents were elected by no more than half of the potential voters. So this figure of 51% underlines something that is absolutely key, Europe matters. Europe has become part of domestic politics, sometimes also in a negative way, due to, to the multiple crises, starting from the financial crisis until the refugee crisis. 
but also positively with a growing awareness that the problems of our time can no longer be solved at national level alone. The EU is not left. Love is never an obligation. The EU is not left, but it is needed. And main, many of the main challenges require a European approach. But Euro-hesitating governments do not dare enough to strive for more Europe, more European cooperation and integration. Trust in the EU, 42%, is higher than trust in national governments on average. That's 35%. What is also positive is that there is still a very large majority, almost 70%, of the four pro-European parties in the European Parliament. The European institutions can continue to function. The next European Parliament, as I said, will still have a strong pro-European majority. But that should not be the last time. Without renewed confidence in national governments and EU institutions, the malaise will continue. We need to get to the heart of the matter. The result of the policies must give citizens the feeling that they are better protected, and the key word, better protected, by their local, regional, national, and European governments against many real or perceived threats. Which are those threats? In some areas and some countries, unemployment, insecure jobs, low purchasing power and growing inequalities, irregular migration, climate change, terrorism, all kinds of dumping and fraud, corruption in some countries, and in some of the countries, Russia, is felt as a danger. Protection, as I said, is a key word. Despite the tangible results of national and European policies in terms of employment, climate change, irregular immigration and others, confidence is not returning. Due to the multiple crises of the last 10 years, that has eroded confidence. Ladies and gentlemen, trust runs away on horseback and returns on foot. If people feel inadequately protected, they will be less likely to support our open democracies, our open societies, so dear to serve, and our open economies. And therefore, protecting people better is a key topic. I cannot deliver a speech on Europe without mentioning Brexit. I apologize for that. And we will be very short on this. What with Brexit in these days with growing fallback on oneself? So, as you know, there will be a new prime minister and he will try to achieve Brexit at all costs by the end of October. A no deal is now more likely than ever. But the situation is more complicated than most British politicians think. Personally, I'm convinced that after an abrupt withdrawal, still a possibility, a hard Brexit, the problems will force the UK to negotiate with the EU after all. A no deal is therefore not the end of the story. I even think that the Brexit itself is not irreversible. Within a few years after having left the EU, the young generation will decide for themselves whether to stick to what the majority of their parents and grandparents have ever decided. Nothing, nothing in life is irreversible, not even Brexit. Nothing is definitive in history, either in one or the other sense. But don't ask me what will happen in the short term. I simply don't know. Wait and see is an overly phlegmatic British reaction. The only positive thing about this saga is that the EU27 are more united. They do not want to give up the acquis, the achievements that have been worked on for so long, and certainly not in order to reach an agreement 
with a country that wants to leave the European Union. In any case, the European caravan will continue to travel without the UK. We are further strengthening the single market, the Eurozone and the Schengen area. It may be too slow, but nobody wants the way back. A few words about the economy, and I bring you good new news. I apologize that from time to time I'm optimistic, that I'm positive. I know it's po not politically correct anymore. <laughs> After the spectacular growth of the number of jobs since 2014, 12 and a half million jobs have been created. There is no deceleration in economic growth in the euro area. And the reasons for this weakening of economic growth in Europe and in the world is mainly political. Protectionism doesn't protect the economy, doesn't protect the people. We all lose. And in the midst of rising global protectionism, the European Union has concluded and started implementing new balanced trade agreements, of which the free trade agreement with Japan, the EU largest bilateral free trade agreement ever. And we did it in the midst of growing protectionism. The EU wants to remain a defender of a rule-based multilateral system, although we seem to be the only ones. Of course, we have problems with some countries. The EU wants to solve differences with China and other nations in the world, but by dialogue, according to the rules themselves of the World Trade Organization, not by a war, not by a trade war. Firmness and dialogue is our method. Protecting our interests without falling into protectionism is our goal. The digital and low carbon revolutions are two of those mega innovations of industrial history. Like the steam engine or electricity in the past, artificial intelligence is transforming our world, our society, and our industry. The digital penetrates into all aspects of economic life and of life all in all. A new kind of man, the digital man, is emerging. In times of slower economic growth, we need to work harder on structural reforms in the Union and in the Member States, especially in the economic sector, given the Union's large backlog of new technologies compared to China and the USA. Also, Germany is affected by this. There is no European digital company in the global top 15. There just aren't any European champions. The Union does not lack invention. Currently, Europe is recognized as a world leader in research. Also, thanks you to, to your work. And the EU has a considerable presence in science and research circles across the globe. But we are lagging behind global competitors when it comes to innovation, to the application of inventions. The development of the European research area has stalled also. Shortcomings need to be addressed urgently. And the European Commission is fully aware of this. More specifically, Europe has no lack of digital business ideas, but few of our innovative European companies scale up and expand in Europe or shape these global markets. So promoting research, also fundamental research, promoting innovation at all levels of government remains a key objective. The draft program, Horizon Europe, the successor of Horizon 2020, is the draft program the biggest scientific program in the world will hopefully be increased by 35% for the upcoming seven years to a level of 100 billion euros. The current program, you know it, the program very well, Horizon 2020, invested strongly in artificial intelligence. And these efforts have significantly contributed to Europe's leadership in robotics and automated slash connected vehicles. But they here too, tangible uptake and innovation remain low. 
I would like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to CERN, which is older than the European Union. It's a shining example of how only, how only cooperation between the nations can lead to global excellence, as, of course, that was a highlight, as in 2012. Resources for artificial intelligence will also increase very significantly at member states' level and at European level. Overall, Europe is behind in private investments in artificial intelligence, which totaled around 3 billion in 2016, compared to 8 billion in Asia and 16 billion in North, Af in North America. China wants to become world leader by 2030. A digital revolution will make it inevitably to join forces at European level, as happened with your institution. European sovereignty here too is at stake. In the end, one dares to speak of a European industrial policy, it is no longer a forbidden word, although all resistance has not yet been overcome. Not by a long shot. We can't miss, for instance, the train of electric cars. It proves once again that there are no acquired rights in the economy. Technology is forcing industrial structures and politics to adapt, and climate concerns add to this. Just a brief comment on climate change. To meet its climate ambitions, the global clean energy transition needs to be dramatically sped up in Europe. The European climate policy produced results. The EU will decrease its greenhouse gas emissions with 23% by 2020, whilst the economy will be 53% bigger than in 1990. So there is a clear decoupling of growth and pollution. As part of our commitments under the Paris agreements, the EU will cut greenhouse gas emissions by at least 40% by 2030. We need brave people to achieve this goal. An ambitious zero pollution strategy, preferably by 2050, would spur innovation in cleaner alternatives and substitutes. But technology alone will not be enough to be the ambitious climate targets. We will also need policies that will not always be popular. Economic growth is not enough. The social question is returning to the surface everywhere. And we also need to look at its distribution. A key problem is who benefits from growth. And the persistence of high unemployment in the number of member states and growing inequalities elsewhere are causing political and social tensions in many countries. This is a problem that affects almost all rich countries, but the European countries less although we have to work on it. One of the many reasons for the inequalities is differences in education. The old definition of welfare state is care from the cradle to the grave. The new definition is training from the cradle to the grave, but training for all. Four in 10 Europeans do not have basic digital skills even though 90% of jobs will require some level of digital literacy in the near future. Ladies and gentlemen, the union must prepare itself for another long-term challenge. The demographic explosion of Europe's neighbor Africa, from 1 billion to 4 billion inhabitants by the end of this century, almost, almost as much, almost as much as Asia, China, and India included. The steep demographic decline in Europe, with an estimated population gap of 15 million people in 2060, 10% of the current numbers of inhabitants, will force us to accept a lot more legal migration. The societal support for legal migration is stronger if illegal migration is under control. My final words, the old world will never come back. And Europe is looking for its place 
in this changing world. Europe works in a global context that also is very shifting. Europe, like others, is seeking its way in this world full of paradoxes, in this apolar world where nobody rules the world anymore. If the famous quote, it's the economy stupid of Bill Clinton, remember, if this quote is right, China is in pole position. In terms of purchasing power parities, China represents almost 19% of world GDP. The US 15 and the euro area 12. And just to compare, Japan represents 4%, the UK 2%, and Russia 3%. The EU 27 is not nostalgic. Make Europe great again is not our slogan. Yes, European nations were once world powers, but those times are over. With just 7% of world's population, the EU represents one-fifth of world output and accounts for almost one quarter of global trade, but we know our limits. We are fully aware also of our untapped potential. We could play a bigger role if we were more united. But here, let us also look at the bright side of things, even in terms of unity. The structural handicaps of our union haven't prevented it from speaking with one voice on the world stage or delivering a unified message on free and fair, rule-based trade. The structural handicaps of the union haven't prevented the union from having a common currency. And a common currency that is the second one most used in the world with a share of almost 36% of global payments. We spoke with one voice, as we did in the Paris Climate Conference in 2015, and we agreed on large parts of foreign policy. On all those issues, we have a common approach, and they are at the core of global policies. And that's why it's regrettable that we have to put so much political energy into internal problems like Brexit and the polarization in many countries. Of course, we have to overcome them, but we do not lose sight of the fact that the economic caravan of the world is moving on, even without us. However, I remain a man of hope. Our political and socio-economic model is more stable in the long term than that of other global actors. Europe has proved far more resilient than many people thought. Ladies and gentlemen, pessimism is an example of intellectual laziness. A pessimist is always right. When it proved to be, when it, uh, uh, things are going badly, he can tell you, I told you so. When the opposite is happening, and there is another outcome, he will tell you, happily so. So he's always right. I remain a man of hope. But hope without work is dead. Hope is a verb. Thank you so much. So is it working? So uh, thank you for this very optimistic talk. And uh, we would like to be optimistic today and uh, all the week and for the future of the strategy. So now it's time to move to the session focused on physics and the machine. And I don't know if Nima has already arrived. He's here. He's coming. <laughs> right in time. So no need to present. Uh, Nima, everybody, everybody knows you. You just landed. <laughs> Welcome. And um, you will be presenting the future collider. And another part of the, of the talk is the future of fundamental physics, which is a very challenging talk. And uh, so we welcome you. And we are ready to listen to you in a few seconds. 
Wait, 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 the microphone. Is the talk loaded up already? Oh, there it is. Okay, fantastic. Yes, yes. All right, well, it's truly wonderful to uh, be here. Is this, is this okay? Is this too loud? No? It's okay. Oh. <laughs> uh, it's really, really wonderful to uh, be here. Um, uh, and I have to say that in, uh, not just in my view, certainly in my view, uh, um, uh, the, the project of... Uh, 100 kilometer circular colliders and Higgs factories and 100 TV colliders ultimately is certainly the most, clearly the most important um, uh, part of the experimental program in fundamental physics that uh, at least I can imagine on the sort of 50 year time scale. Um, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here to uh, at least share my own perspective for why, why this is true. And <clears throat> there's a bit of a cognitive dissonance in this entire subject. I'm sure many of you, certainly those of you who are in, uh, uh, who are in, the, in the trenches of uh, particle physics have felt it. Um, there are some people, like probably the majority of you in this room, uh, who think this is one of the most amazing times in the history of uh, fundamental physics. Um, there's really exciting and important things going on. And there are other people who are wandering around with their heads hung low, and they're saying, oh my gosh, it's all over. We haven't seen anything but the Hagues. Uh, if we don't see other things, you know, we might as well pack our bags and go home. Who's right? <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, um, uh, we can't both be right. Uh, but in fact, we can kind of both be right, uh, because it depends on what you think is actually the point of doing um, uh, fundamental physics, what the point is of doing particle physics. If you think the point of doing particle physics is to discover new particles, <laughs> then uh, you might as well take your ball and go home right now. Okay? There's absolutely no guarantee that there's any new particles to be seen anywhere be between here and, I don't know, uh, you know uh, incredibly high energies close to the uh, uh, Planck scale. So if that's the point, if that's what drove you, if that's what you thought was going to happen, maybe with some tiny chance you'd go to Stockholm with a plot with a giant bump in it, then forget it. We don't know that's going to happen. Okay? We cannot guarantee that that's going to happen. However, I would say, uh, certainly this is what I think, um, that's not the absolute deepest aspect of what's going on in the fundamental physics. And in fact, uh, the very deepest aspects of our subject have not always been associated with plots like that and trips like that. Um, and that's what I would like to uh, uh, tell you about today. So uh, from my point of view, uh, how, do I, how do I move this forward here? Which button do I push? Green button, ah, good. Uh, it all boils down, you see, from, from, from my point of view, uh, and again, not just my point of view, what's fundamental about, what's important about particle physics is not the particles per se, but the study of the fundamental laws of nature as governed by uh, the still largely mysterious union of space-time and quantum mechanics. And those were the two big revolutions of the first part of the 20th century. And those are the things that we still don't very deeply understand today. And in fact, the issues that have been raised by the discoveries made at the LHC, uh, seeing the Higgs particle, of course, triumphantly um, uh, 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 in, on July 4th, 2012, and, uh, and everything which has happened since, which is not seeing other particles that, uh, that should have come along uh, for the ride with the Higgs from what many theorists expected for four decades. These are all things that heighten a certain tension that has to do with this overlap between these fundamental principles of, uh, of space-time and quantum mechanics. And that's what I'd like to uh, explain um, in this talk. So you're probably going to see in the rest of this week many more detailed plots and reaches and uh, things like that. So I want to actually back up and just explain to you in as clean and clear and simple a way as possible what the drama is that is at stake and, uh, and why, why I think this uh, experimental program is so crucial. So let's begin with a very simple question. What is particle physics? And um, maybe many of you don't uh, realize this, but the very name 
the very, the, it's built in to the, uh, uh, to the subject, uh, has to do with the notions of space, time, and quantum mechanics. Before asking what's particle physics, we should ask what is a particle. Uh, and what is a particle has everything to do with space, time, and quantum mechanics. So what is a particle? Um, well, the most naively, a particle is a little blob of mass or energy that can sort of uh, move around without changing its, uh, uh, without dispersing too much. But a little bit more fundamentally than that, um, uh, there are two important notions. One of them is that uh, why do we give, why do we say that what we have an electron here and we give it the same name electron here and the same name electron there? That's because the world has a symmetry of translational invariance, okay? And so the property of what we mean, even the name that we give the particle, the fact that we give it the same name from place to place to place is reflecting uh, one of the symmetries of space and time. Why do we call an electron moving this way an electron and also give it the same name when it's moving that way and moving that way? It's because of rotational invariance, okay? So uh, even, so, uh, so, the first basic uh, fact of life is that we have these space-time symmetries of translations, rotations, and boosts, and uh, those dictate even the names that we give the elementary particles. Beyond that, uh, the world is uh, quantum mechanical, and so once we've decided that, uh, that, that we have an object that, for example, behaves nicely under translation, so that's, uh, uh, that's an eigenstate of momenta, then we can also ask what other kinds of possible labels it can have. And th these are um, observations going back to Eugene Wigner in the 1930s that, that tell us that what we should think of as a particle, something labeled not just by its momentum, but also by other possible quantum numbers, is something that carries a certain representation of the symmetries of space and time. So the technical way of saying it is that particles are, in fact, unitary representations of translations and Lorentz transformations or the Poincaré symmetry. And so built into the very definition of what a particle is are these uh, notions of quantum mechanics and space time. So particle physics is the study of the fundamental laws of nature uh, governed by the still mysterious union of quantum mechanics and space time. And I'm emphasizing this over and over again. This is what's special about our field. We have H bar and C. We have quantum mechanics and space time, and those things are still not perfectly well understood. And as I said, uh, many of the deepest mysteries have to do with some aspect of the actually triumvirate of ideas involving quantum mechanics, space time, and the vacuum that we still don't understand. So before highlighting what we don't understand and why the experimental program of 100 kilometer machines, Higgs factories, and 100 TV colliders are so central, to the program of fundamental physics, let me spend five or seven minutes uh, reviewing where we've gotten to. Okay? And again, I want to review where we've gotten to in a way that makes the closeness of the phenomenon to the underlying fundamental principles of quantum mechanics and space-time as manifest as possible, with no veil of fancy mathematical formalism or anything between the principles and the phenomenon. That's one of the real triumphs of the 20th century is this fact, and I want to present it in as clean a way uh, as I can. So the march, in fact, of the last 400 years of fundamental physics can really be thought of as a march of reductionism and a march uh, of symmetries. Um, and, uh, and maybe the highlight of this, um, after the discovery of, of, of relativity and quantum mechanics in the uh, early part of the 20th century, is the following slogan that we can now say, and which has real teeth and has real meaning, which is the following. Um, there is an incredible rigidity that goes with these twin principles of relativity and quantum mechanics. And we can now say that whatever the ultimate theory of the world is, and we don't know what it is yet, but whatever it is, being compatible with the principles of space-time and the principles of quantum mechanics already tells us something remarkable. Whatever the underlying theory is, at long enough distances, it's guaranteed to be described by massless particles in some approximation interacting in the simplest possible way where three elementary particles meet at a point in space-time. Uh, the fact that we can reduce our discussion to thinking about massless particles is one aspect of reductionism. The fact, the, the idea that the basic principles are manifest at very short distances that quantum mechanics tells us corresponds to very high energies, so that's why in some zeroth order approximation it's sensible to neglect all the particle masses. Uh, uh, and the fact that the 
that, that the fundamental interactions uh, involve three particles meeting at a point in space-time, and the nature of those interactions are almost completely dictated by, by symmetries. And the incredible thing is when you put these two principles together and you give sufficiently competent theoretical physicists food and graduate students and so on and tell them to go in a room and think what a universe could look like compatible with these principles, they'll come back and tell you that it's incredibly rigid. It's almost impossible. And if you're going to make it happen, uh, the only spins for these massless particles that you're allowed to have are spins 0, 1 half, 1, 3 halves, and 2 that this two guy is very special, for example. It's totally unique. You can only have one of them. It has to have universal interactions. It makes massive particles go around in orbits. It's gravity, but uh, you don't need anything other than sort of pure thought after you know these deep principles of relativity and quantum mechanics to be able to deduce its existence as one of the consistent possibilities. And, um, and anyway, so there's a very rigid and small set of principles uh, small set of elementary particles and interactions that are allowed. Let me give you a flavor of the kind of argument that uh, goes into this. Um, you don't have to uh, understand any of this in detail. This is uh, just uh, um, uh, somewhat impressionistic for those of you who haven't seen this before. Oh, what happened here? Okay, here we, here we go. Um, so uh, remember, we're focusing on the dynamics of uh, massless particles, and uh, and it turns out that just in order to describe the momenta of massless particles, there's a very convenient set of uh, uh, spinorial variables to, uh, to uh, do it. So, um, so if you imagine just talking about the four momenta of a massless particle, so it has an energy component, P0, P1, P2, and P3, you can group them into a two-by-two two matrix that's sort of familiar from undergraduate quantum mechanics using poly matrices. And the fact that the particle is massless tells you that the determinant of this matrix is zero, so you can write it as the outer product of two two-dimensional vectors. And that greatly simplifies talking about uh, this, uh, uh, that greatly simplifies talking about this physics. When you then imagine what happens when three particles meet at a point in space-time, and that's the simplest possible interaction that you could imagine, where three points, particles move, uh, uh, meet at one point in space-time, then this can happen in only two ways where these uh, uh, two-dimensional vectors, either one kind or the other kind, are parallel to each other. Uh, and remarkably, it turns out that the nature of that interaction, you've never heard of anything, no one has uh, taught you a uh, you know, graduate course in quantum field theory, you're not thinking about Lagrangians or anything like that. There's no formalism involved here. You're just following your nose and writing down the only thing you can compatible with the, uh, with the symmetries of relativity. It, it turns out once you specify the spins or the helicities of these massless particles, it's completely specified. Up to the strength of the, this interaction, it's completely specified by Poincaré symmetry. Okay, so that tells you that, uh, that directly from the symmetries of space-time, the leading kind of interactions elementary particles can have are nailed. There's nothing you can, you can do about it. All right? Next, let's say we're talking about spin-1 particles, just for fun. Okay, so we're talking about massless spin-1 particles. Let's say I have a whole bunch of them that I'm, uh, I'm just going to label uh, I'm just going to label them with labels A, B, and C. If I have 10 of them, these labels, let's say, would go from 1 to 10. Then, if you just take these rules into account, exactly the formula that I told you before tells you you have uh, some expression that looks like this. Um, and now you have to input some information from quantum mechanics. That if you have a, now not just a, a, a three particle process, but a four particle process, that this four particle process has an opportunity to blow up or develop a pole when you can actually produce an intermediate uh, guy, um, uh, a particle that used to be virtual and make it real. And quantum mechanics dictates that, that when that happens, this, the amplitude for this process should factorize into the, into the product of the two pieces for making the intermediate particle and having the intermediate particle decay out to the other end. So on the previous slide, we had space time on this, uh, on this slide, we have quantum mechanics and unitarity. And that ends up telling you that those constants have to be very, very special. They have to satisfy exactly the identities that allow us to infer that this system must be described by a gauge theory. And once again, it has nothing to do with beauty and elegance. And you might think there are 15,000 other ways of doing it. No, there is one way of doing it. And there's no, other, there's no uh, alternatives. Uh, it's just nailed by these requirements of space-time and quantum mechanics. 
Okay, so, and that's, that's the general story. That's the general story uh, that leads to this remarkable uh, conclusion that whatever the underlying theory is, if you're talking about massless particles, then, at, uh, then uh, at, at, at some leading order in their interaction, this is the only set of menu of possibilities that we're allowed to uh, talk about. All right, but now what about masses? We know that particles have masses. And here there's a, there's a famous story uh, that uh, when you have particles that have mass, your most naive expectation is that as you go to very high energies, you can ignore the masses of the particles. But here again, relativity rears its head in an interesting way. There is a qualitative difference between uh, a massive particle and a massless particle when that particle has spin. If you have a massive spin one particle, like a W or a Z boson, however it's uh, however quickly it's moving, you can always catch up with it and go to a frame where it's at rest. And however it's spinning, by tilting your head, you can see it spinning in three different directions. So a massive spin one particle has three degrees of freedom, whereas a massless spin one particle, like a photon, only has two degrees of freedom because you can never catch up with it. Okay? And that very basic fact that two is not equal to three is at the heart of some of al almost all the drama <laughs> of theoretical physics in the 20th century is about that fact that two is not equal to three for uh, the difference between massless and massive when it comes to spin one particles. And two is not equal to five when it comes to the difference between massless and massive for spin two particles and so on, okay? So, uh, so it's not trivial to have mass. You have extra degrees of freedom and uh, you have to be able to smoothly interpolate between the world of massive particles at low energies and massless particles at high energies. And just by counting on your fingers, you find that you can't do it unless you have something else. And famously, that's something else. Uh, the simplest possible thing that something else could be in the context of the massive particles we know of in nature. Uh, if you just took the massive particles we knew about before July 4th, 2012, just by counting on your fingers, you could see that it was impossible to take the things that we saw and reorganize them into consistent massless particles interactions at very high energies. And all it took was one single solitary degree of freedom, the Higgs particle, to allow us to do that. So the story of the Higgs then is an, is is the correction to this picture that when everything is massless, it's totally determined by grand principles. And now when particles are massive, something has got to allow us to smoothly interpolate between massive at low energies and massless at high energies. And the incredible thing is that just one particle, single particle, was all it took to uh, do that. So now, now we have a smooth story that lets us uh, understand the gross properties of everything we see in the universe around us, starting from incredibly basic fundamental principles of, uh, of uh, relativity and quantum mechanics. All right, so uh, what are some of the lessons of this? Well, one lesson for a theorist is that the belief in principles paid off. So we had these basic principles. We had, uh, we had these basic principles that completely fixed the properties of, the, uh, of particles in the massless limit. And we had to figure out some way of interpolating between massive at low energies and massless at high energies. And there aren't 15,000 things you can do. In fact, all we, all we had way, way back when, uh, all we knew was that this is all we are allowed. Particles of spin 0, half, 1, 3 halves, and 2. And what nature had taken advantage of as far as we knew was particles of spin a half, like the electron, spin 1, like the, like the photons and the gluons and the Ws and Zs, and spin 2, the graviton. But we had never seen the elementary particles of spin zero, nor elementary particles of spin three halves. So that's the constrained life of the theoretical physicist. You have to figure out how to solve puzzles within a very, very constrained theoretical framework. And the amazing thing is that uh, this, we saw the first really new kind of elementary particle we've seen in 50 years. What allowed us to do it was uh, to make that <laughs> Uh, to, to take advantage of this possibility that we'd never seen before of an elementary particle of spin zero. This leaves a single thing left over that nature, that we have not seen nature do that's compatible with its grand principles, which is to take advantage of the possibility of having massless particles of spin three halves. This is a possibility that's associated with supersymmetry, something I won't say anything about uh, for the rest of this talk, but just, just to emphasize, this is the reason, the dominant reason most theoretical physicists find this idea interesting is because we've seen nature take advantage of everything it can do, and that's the last thing that it can do that we have not yet seen it do. So it's, uh, if for that reason alone, it's, it's worth uh, 
uh, looking for. All right, so that's the summary of where we are. So, uh, but I, I've said a number of times that we seem to be at one of those points that comes along in the history of physics every 100 years or so where something very large and structural <laughs> is at stake in our understanding of nature. So what are the indications for that? Well, there are these indications for 21st century revolutions. And they all have to do with the fact that these two principles of space-time and quantum mechanics, while being spectacularly successful and restrictive uh, um, uh, in, our, in, in uh, describing nature, that there are very good reasons to believe that they're approximate. At least one, or perhaps both of these ideas might end up being approximate. And I'll, I'll talk uh, a little bit more about, uh, uh, the, about the aspect that has to do with the doom of space-time um, and emphasize its relationship to the end of reductionism. So uh, we have lots of good in indications, uh, theoretical indications, that, that the idea of space-time is approximate. And going along with it, the entire reductionist paradigm that's driven, uh, that's driven fundamental physics for uh, 400 years is essentially false. Um, and we also have another a large set of challenges that might end up being related to the first set of ideas to, uh, to try to give a simple understanding to a, very, uh, uh, to a very basic question, why is the universe big? Maybe it's the, most, uh, it's the most obvious feature of the universe around us is it's large, even though it's made out of small things, and even though the laws that govern it hold sway on microscopic distances, but it's, it's paradoxical that the universe is big because these very quantum mechanical laws that are otherwise spectacularly successful would lead you to, to suspect more and more violent quantum mechanical fluctuations at shorter and shorter distances that would seem to want to destroy any macroscopic order we see in the universe around us. So I'm gonna explain, uh, I'm gonna explain these, these points in a second, but I wanna highlight that it's clear that really new ideas are needed uh, that are likely to go beyond the paradigms of space-time and internal symmetry. So first, let me explain uh, this uh, business about the end of reductionism and the end of space-time and so on. Um, yet another aspect of this is a slogan that the deep ultraviolet starts turning into the deep infrared again um, because of quantum mechanics and gravity. So um, imagine, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, not worry about the, about the practical uh, details of life in the 21st century where we're struggling to get to 100 TeV. Uh, imagine that you had some, uh, some experimentalist in the 32nd century uh, who has a, a Planck scale accelerator, right? They've finally managed to get to the Planck scale and they're colliding particles at around the uh, Planck scale. Now, we have this idea that we go to higher energies to probe shorter distances. But eventually, something very bad happens. Eventually, uh, uh, as, you, as you pile so much energy into such a tiny region of space, uh, because of gravity, that region is, uh, gravitates, and you put so much energy into su such a tiny region of space that you actually collapse the region that you're looking at into a black hole. And that makes it impossible to see what's going on in there. And let's say you get frustrated and build an even bigger accelerator, what happens? You make an even bigger black hole. Okay, that makes it even harder to see what's going on inside. So this, so this very basic thought experiment tells you the, the entire picture that super duper high energies, the super duper short distances, that the universe is somehow fundamentally determined at the tiniest possible distances is basically wrong. First, the whole notion of space and time is breaking down at incredibly short distances. Secondly, uh, uh, if anything, as you go to ultra super high energy, you start probing very large distances again. Okay, so that's a very basic fact that has to do with the ex existence of quantum mechanics and gravity, but it has this startling consequence that this basic reductionist paradigm, if you're a technical quantum field theorist, it's associated with one of the giants of quantum field theory in the 20th century, Ken Wilson, so we call it the Wilsonian effective field theory paradigm. Um, this paradigm is false because of gravity. Okay, it's basically false. It tells us that the fundamental laws of nature are nothing like that of condensed matter physics, ultimately. Um, this entire paradigm where we have a separation between the world and the laws is given at ultra short distances and some effective theory merging at long distances, this paradigm was born of very fruitful and profound analogies between particle physics and condensed matter physics. That analogy has limits, has very fundamental limits, and our universe is not like some random condensed matter system. The ideas are much deeper and more radical. Now, 
these things have been appreciated for a long time, but, it might, but you might think that, well, maybe these issues are relevant when you start making black holes and getting up to these Planckian energies or so on, but they're not, they're not necessarily relevant you know, directly above our head as we're exploring things in the neighborhood of the TeV scale, a point that I'll come back to in a moment. So let's come back to this uh, second point. Why is there a macroscopic universe? Uh, well, uh, there are many aspects of why there is a macroscopic universe. One of them is why do we, en why do we enjoy these enormous separations of scale between microscopic distances like the Planck length that we just talked about and macrophysics, right? And at, at a very basic level, um, we can ask, for example, why are the elementary particle masses so tiny compared to uh, uh, these uh, uh, Planckian energies? In fact, even before talking about why, why they're tiny, let's ask an even more basic question. Um, why do we get to talk about particles like the photon being massless? Why is a photon massless? Uh, after all, the photon plowing through the vacuum has all these virtual uh, quantum mechanical fluctuations with electrons and more photons and very, very complicated things as it's moving through the vacuum. Um, we even think colloquially of the vacuum as some kind of medium. I mean, it's not like an ether, it's a Lorentz invariant medium, but still, uh, there's a sense in which the vacuum has all these properties. Why do these properties not endow the photon with a mass? It has these very complicated interactions as it's uh, uh, moving through, through the vacuum. Well, the reason is simple and deep. The photon does not have a mass because two is not equal to three, <laughs> okay? Because if in any approximation, uh, you found yourself with a massless photon. Because a massless photon has two degrees of freedom and a massive one has three, little changes like these quantum mechanical corrections, uh, um, uh, virtual corrections with particles popping in and out of the vacuum cannot give rise out of the blue to discontinuously to a third degree of freedom. So because two is not equal to three, that's the reason why the photon is massless. And this explains many things. This explains why a friends in condensed matter physics can engineer cool condensed matter systems that at large distances give rise to many of the uh, qualitative ingredients of the sort we see in the standard model. They can get things that look like massless gauge fields, chiral fermions, a lot of the things that we see in the standard model can be, I mean, it's not literally the standard model, of course, but the qualitative phenomenon can be engineered in interesting condensed matter systems. Why? Because the existence of of massless objects with spin is, is reasonable in this way. It's robust. I can't discontinuously give them a mass because I can't make the number of degrees of freedom jump. Okay, that's what's different about the Higgs. This argument does not work for the Higgs, and that's what's special about the Higgs. The whole irony of the Higgs is that it's the simplest possible elementary particle we could imagine. It has almost no properties. It just has mass. It doesn't have spin, it doesn't have charge, it doesn't have anything other than mass, okay? It's the simplest possible elementary particle, and that very simplicity is what makes it so theoretically per perplexing. You see, as the Higgs is wandering through the vacuum, if you make, try to make exactly the same argument for the Higgs as we made for the photon, you fail. It's a massless, it's a, it's a spin zero particle, and there is no difference between the number of degrees of freedom of a, of a, uh, of a massless and a massive spin zero particle. They both have one degree of freedom. There's absolutely no reason why the, uh, the interaction of the Higgs with all these virtual quantum mechanical fluctuations cannot give it an enormous mass. This is also why you cannot engineer in a state of nature or in any condensed matter system or anywhere else we've seen in any other phenomenon in nature something like the Higgs. Even though we've seen things like everything else that we've seen in the standard model, cousins of them in other parts of physics, the Higgs is totally special for this reason. This logic has worked elsewhere in physics and it explains why you don't pick up hunks of material and see Higgs-like excitations in them, even though you can see the other kind of uh, uh, excitations in them relatively commonly. So this is an enormous irony because this entire story that I told you about how space-time and quantum mechanics nails everything when particles are massless, and then we have this detail to worry about with mass. We have to get an extra degree of, extra degrees of freedom somehow. The Higgs is the simplest possible thing, one degree of freedom that allows us to interpolate between massive at low energies and massless at high energies. And that tells us why the mass of all the elementary particles has to be pegged to the mass of the Higgs. The enormous irony after all this spectacular progress is we don't understand where the mass of the Higgs itself came from. Um, 
for this very simple reason, that uh, instead of two not equal to three uh, for, for photons and two not equal to five for gravitons, we have one equals one <laughs> for the Higgs, and we simply do not understand. Uh, uh, we cannot compute uh, from first principles theoretically the origin of the mass of the Higgs. All right, uh, let me skip this slide. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll just say that there are many other ways of, uh, of seeing that, uh, that there is a problem um, uh, of seeing exactly the same issue. Uh, one of them is to do a very simple estimate where you just look at the energy uh, in all the quantum mechanical uh, fluctuations. Every mode in the universe, you put the universe in an enormous box, every mode in the universe has a half h bar omega zero point energy from fermions and from bosons. And if you add that half h bar omega up, um, uh, zero point energy up for everything we know of in the universe, uh, you find two big surprises that there should be an enormous energy density in the vacuum. That's the cosmological constant problem. That enormous energy in density in the vacuum should curve the universe to, in to very tiny sizes. Instead, we have this gigantic universe, sort of 10 billion uh, uh, light years across. Um, and just the subleading correction to this calculation would tell you that there should be an enormous inertia or mass generated for the Higgs, again, that we have not seen. Uh, and so these, this one little back of the envelope estimate, uh, which is all about why is the universe big, we see that we don't have a good understanding of why the universe is big. Violent quantum mechanical fluctuations at shorter and shorter distances would seem to totally destroy any kind of microscopic order that we could have. It's not an inconsistency with the theory. We can certainly accommodate the fact that the universe is big, but we don't have any first principle calculation that allows us to uh, just come up with a formula for the size of the universe or for the, uh, for the mass associated with the Higgs. So these issues uh, are one of many indications that we have to move beyond symmetries. So I just told you already that the issue uh, with the Higgs uh, is that we have one degree of freedom for the Higgs, regardless of whether the Higgs mass squared is slightly bigger than zero, equal to zero, or even slightly less than zero. There's no difference. That's exactly the hierarchy problem. The avatar of this phenomenon in cosmology, almost exactly the same words and issues are involved. Uh, we have exactly the same amount of symmetry in a universe that has either a positive, a zero, or a negative cosmological constant. There's nothing special about very small or zero cosmological constant. We simply have a universe that has either a de Sitter symmetry, flat space, or anti de Sitter symmetry. And so these are both indications that the main workhorse we've had for uh, certainly the last 100 years, as, as the analytic continuation of the 300 that came before that, of symmetries as uh, simple explanations for the gross uh, features of the universe is now breaking down. And it's breaking down from the two great discoveries of the last, uh, of the last uh, 20, 30 years, the discovery of the accelerating universe and the discovery of the Higgs particle. So these are some of the dramas of the 21st century um, uh, uh, I've mentioned. Uh, there's the question of how space-time might emerge from more basic building blocks. Uh, there's the question of why there's a macroscopic universe, and these questions may be related to each other, but in any case, it's clear that we're missing something huge about the quantum mechanics of our relativistic vacuum. And I want to stress that the Higgs discovery is absolutely crucial, because it shows that our relativistic quantum vacuum is qualitatively different than anything we've seen anywhere in physics. Now, we already have these arguments that the breakdown of the Wilsonian picture and reductionism and all of this stuff had to hit us in the face at some point, but maybe it could be deferred all the way up to the Planck scale where, where, where monsters be. Now we have, from what we've seen so far, we've seen the Higgs, we haven't seen anything else. We now see that we have more and more indication there's something wrong with this basic worldview already above our head, right where we are now, not just at the Planck scale, but already at the uh, uh, PEV scale. And in many ways, the Higgs is the most important character in this drama because we can put it under the most incisive and precise uh, experimental scrutiny. So uh, people ask all the time, um, if we don't see the Higgs, if we don't see anything, any, uh, anything on the Higgs, we don't see any new physics, we can't be guaranteed that future machines will see new physics. These, this language drives me bananas. <laughs> 
because, in fact, the Higgs itself is really new physics. It's much more profoundly new physics than had we just discovered this or that random other particle. Okay? Uh, there is some collection of people who would have been thrilled if we had not discovered the Higgs and discovered something like Technicolor or strong dynamics for electroweak symmetry breaking. That would have been perfectly great. It would have been another 40 years of repeating the exercises that we did as we discovered things about QCD. And it would not be remotely the paradigm changing, amazing, you know, dramatic thing that we've gotten by just, quote unquote, just seeing the Higgs. Okay? Just, quote unquote, seeing the Higgs is the most surprising, shocking, sort of paradigm shifting thing that could have happened so far. Uh, a lot of theorists, maybe some experimentalists, wish that it wasn't quite so paradigm shifting, okay? But, uh, but uh, that's, that's what it is. I think the, uh, um, so, uh, and it's a harbinger of some profound new principles at work uh, in the quantum vacuum. So we have to look at it closely. And I'll just end quickly with these, uh, with what, what's, what's at stake. So the, the arguments for what we need to do are extremely simple. All the drama about the Higgs has to do with the fact that it appears to be an elementary spin zero particle, the first elementary spin zero particle we've ever seen. So we've never seen one before. So the, the central question is how point-like is it really? And the picture that we're gonna get from the LHC, um, even if we get a lot more data, the picture we're gonna get from the LHC will not tell us convincingly whether uh, the Higgs is much more elementary seeming than the pion. The issue of whether a particle is elementary or not is not, some, uh, is not a hard and fast one. It's a question of whether it appears point-like on distances short compared to its natural Compton wavelength. And what, what we know from the pion is that the, that the Compton wavelength of the pion is around 1 over 130 MeV. And there's a bit of a, you know, there's a factor of maybe five shorter distances where we finally saw the substructure associated with the pion, let's say associated with excitations like the Rho meson. That ratio is about what we'll have. That's about the resolution we'll have on the Higgs from the, uh, from the LHC. And clearly, in the case of the pion, the world didn't end that we had a roughly uh, uh, elementary particle. It was finally seen to be composite. Well, we won't know whether the Higgs is like that or more elementary than that. So we'll have to put it under a microscope and see if it's more elementary than that. The first question is if it looks more, uh, more elementary than that to external probes. So for instance, you'd like to see whether it literally looks more point-like by how it couples to two photons, or how it couples to two Z particles, and so on. And that's what a Higgs factory will do. The Higgs factory will let us improve this resolution on the Higgs by roughly a factor of 10 relative to what we'll see from the LHC. And so it'll tell us by that factor of 10 uh, for sure whether it's like a pion, or if it's not, that it's definitely not like a pion. It is most certainly not like anything we've seen before. So that's what, uh, that's, that's, to my mind, the, the, the main thing we'll learn from the, uh, from the Higgs factory. And we might also like to know uh, whether the Higgs looks point-like to itself. And uh, to do that, we have to see this famous triple interaction between the uh, Higgs particle. Um, we'll, we'll, we might get some indication whether this coupling even exists at the LHC, but the 100 TV collider will not only tell us if it's there, but will measure it to about 5% 5, 5 accuracy. So you want to know whether the Higgs looks point-like to other things, you'll learn that from a Higgs factory. You want to know most fundamentally whether the Higgs looks point-like to itself, uh, you, you'll learn that at 100 TV Collider. And it's remarkable, I don't have time to go through this, it's remarkable that in fact the Higgs is unique in being the only elementary particle that can actually enjoy the simplest possible interaction in nature. The only elementary particle which can uh, enjoy the, the interaction of a single particle uh, with three of them meeting at a point in space-time. We have those kind of interactions elsewhere in nature, but always some quantum number changes. Some color or flavor or spin quantum number changes. The only particle that is allowed to have this as its dominant interaction is the Higgs. So not only would we see that the Higgs looks point-like to itself, we'd also see the cleanest, most simple fundamental interaction uh, in nature, a prospect that certainly gets me very excited every time I think about it. And of course, also 100 TV Collider will blast into the high energy frontier, uh, will have access to new particles around 10 times heavier than what we can reach at the LHC, and uh, theoretically, very importantly, will probe these violent quantum mechanical fluctuations by the square of that amount with a power around 100 times what we get at the LHC. All right, so the challenge for experiment is totally clear. Um, just put the Higgs under a microscope, study it to death. That's 
completely obvious. You see a particle you've never seen before, you don't just walk away and shrug. You have to understand everything you possibly can about it. Um, uh, the challenge for theory is deeper than it has been for 40 years. These pe uh, people have been thinking for 40 years about the origin of the cosmological constant and the Higgs mass. The problems have not been solved the way people imagined before, which means that they just got harder, not easier, but they got harder and more profound. Uh, and it's something that we need to be uh, thinking about with more radical ideas. Anyway, I don't have time to talk about uh, dark matter and a few of the other things. Let me just end. Um, uh, I've said already a number of times, it's not just my own view. Um, but certainly it's my view that the scientific issues that we face today are the most difficult and profound ones that fundamental physics has, uh, has faced since the revolutions of relativity and quantum mechanics. I profoundly, I deeply believe this. Uh, and uh, the questions that are raised by these two giant experimental discoveries of our, of our generation, the accelerating universe and the Higgs, they both go to the heart of our understanding of the nature of space-time, quantum mechanics, and the vacuum. And our friends in astronomy are, are, are think it's extremely important to go out and measure everything they can about the expansion of the universe in order to, uh, to, to, to learn more about this mysterious uh, vacuum energy to see is it really a vacuum energy, is it something else? Uh, you actually have to go and look at it carefully. And the Higgs gives us a much richer experimental program with many other handles, which is the sort of particle physics avatar of exactly the same set of issues in uh, cosmology. So, Certainly, uh, I'll reiterate again that from my point of view, the most critical experimental program uh, for, the, for the foreseeable future in fundamental physics is the one that you're all uh, doing much more than I am to uh, make, make a reality. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we, we have time for one or two questions. Maybe I have one. You have not said much about uh, gravity itself. You, you don't. You have not commented much about the gravity and the spin two. Yeah. Well, I, I, as I said, um, we, we've had these indications for for decades that there is something different about gravity, and that something different means that this whole picture of the of the uh, of the separation of scales between very short distances. You know, there's this idea that whatever's going on at super duper short distances can't really affect the world at long distances a lot, other than through setting the values of parameters like the electric charge or the mass of the electron or something like that. And other than that, the details of what's going on at very high energies are not particularly important. Uh, that's, uh, that's sort of hardwired into the, into the standard quantum field theorist picture of the world. And uh, we've had all these indications for a long time because of gravity, there was something wrong with that worldview, right? Um, still, I think most people thought that, uh, that that's, that's, that's to do with gravity, it's very far away, it's, uh, you know, it, 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 it's interesting for a different kind of talk and a different kind of audience and a different kind of question. But these practical issues about particle physics are not gonna be infected by that. You know, this is something for the 30th, for the year 3,000 when we have these Planck scale colliders. The incredible thing is that uh, we're now seeing something that's more similar <laughs> between the story of the Higgs and the cosmological constant. As I said, had we seen any of these things that people were expecting for 40 years, um, had we seen supersymmetric particles, had we seen strong dynamics, had we seen any of these things that had been expected, that would actually, that would justify this attitude that, well, these are different problems. There is something going on with gravity that's deep to do with the breakdown of reductionism, blah, blah, blah. And, but there's these other more straight, straightforward things and we're more or less on, on the right track with them. Um, instead, what we're seeing is that, is that the, the Higgs is refusing to be treated in the way that theorists wanted it to be treated by ignoring all these other problems. And there's actually the, the beginning of strong indications that they're more similar to each other. Um, that's actually profound. That's, that's very important for, for the theorists. It's very confusing for the theorists. I mean, I, I have to say that, uh, that I had this one, one slide about it, but, the challenge that's posed by, by seeing the Higgs and not seeing anything else makes these problems, they didn't go away, they just became much harder, okay? And if I was a 25-year-old graduate student, I would be licking my lips because I would say, that's great, I don't have to read any of these stupid papers that these guys wrote for 40 years and now I get to uh, try to come up with some really radical uh, new idea. And that's what's needed. What's needed is some kind of radical new idea to attack these problems. That's what theorists have to do. That's difficult to legislate. That's difficult to get up and have conferences and meetings about 
have radical idea. Great, right? But you have to, you have to do it. It's not so obvious. Uh, but to the experimentalist, it's completely obvious what to do. You just take the Higgs, you put it under a much more powerful microscope, and you see what the heck is going on. You do not walk away from this crazy new phenomenon you've never seen anywhere else in physics just because it's simple. You see, the argument that, oh, we've seen the Higgs, oh, it's boring, we knew about it for 50 years already, is just totally dumb because its very simplicity is what's so surprising about it. Okay? So the fact that it's just one thing is actually the entire point. It's very surprising, it's mysterious, you have to look at it and see what it's actually doing. Okay, thank you. I think it's a very good transition for the next talk, so thank you again. Thank you. And, and no need to present Michael, and he will present the machine we need for doing the physics presented. Michael? So the, co the talk is overview of the FCC study. So it's a pleasure for me to welcome you on behalf of the FCC Coordination Group at this uh, fifth FCC week, which is at the same time um, the closure of the first phase of the FCC study. It was the conceptual design phase, and for this one we wrote up the FCC design report. So I would like to use this occasion to also look back a little bit on the historic evolution. I think from NEMA, we, we just thought the extremely inspiring talk that we were hoping for, that's uh, out of the question. I would like to thank him for taking this role again, because he also already helped us a lot in 2014. For those that were there, they may still remember. We also gave an inspiring talk with slightly different uh, direction at that time um, at the FCC kickoff meeting. So in my talk, I want to say a few words, a few slides on the introduction to the study goals and the organization. And then I focus on the results of this first phase, on the conceptual design reports and the input that was delivered to the European strategy update. And then I close with a few slides on um, next steps immediately now in 2020 and uh, outlook on a slightly larger time scale. Now, just to remind you, um, this was the start of all it. It was the European strategy update in 2013 that said to propose an ambitious post-LHC accelerator project at CERN by the time of the next strategy update, CERN should and uh, undertake design studies for accelerators in a global context with emphasis on proton, proton, electron, positron, high energy frontier machines, coupled to R&D programs, of course, and organized uh, at an international level in global collaboration. So we followed exactly these points, which were very good advice. And I think we have, we have uh, come by now with uh, a proposal for an ambitious post-LHC accelerator program. And we are looking forward to the discussions and the recommendation of the presently ongoing strategy. Now, let me just remind you of what the scope was that we defined in 2014 at the start of the study, was to make an international FCC collaboration. CERN would act as the host laboratory, and we would look typically for a circular accelerator infrastructure of around 100 kilometer in circumference in the Geneva basin, of course, linked to the accelerator complex of CERN. And we were focusing on two machines. One is an electron Positron Collider FCCE as the potential first step of such a program. And the second one is a ambitious, highest energy Hadron Collider in the same tunnel infrastructure. And uh, the parameter space that we, that we defined at that moment was to uh, try and aim at 16 Tesla magnet technology, would, which would result in about a 100 TV collision energy of such a machine. Then uh, some more aspects were added, of course, uh, a study on a high-energy LHC machine using, again, this uh, high-field magnet technology, and, of course, 
we were folding into this program link to the Hadron machines, FCCHH and high energy LHC, the possibility of operating ions and uh, the options of a Hadron lepton machine configuration. Now, I will not go into the physics here, but just to remind you at very high level what the goals of these machines are and what the corresponding impact on the machine design was. Clearly for FCC is a precision uh, machine uh, that should improve uh, significantly many of the electroweak quantities and parameters, and it could explore uh, the energy range up to around 100 TeV via couplings. So in this case, the impact on machine design was very clear from the beginning to maximize luminosities at the four working points set W, set Higgs, and TD bar. For HH, is uh, clear to go for the highest possible center of mass collision energy that can be achieved with a proton collider in such a 100 kilometer infrastructure. And therefore, we aimed at the 100 uh, TV center of mass energy and also a correspondingly higher luminosity than we will reach on the high luminosity LHC, about a factor 10 more, uh, aiming at around 20 inverse autobahn in 25 years. And for the third machine study, high energy LHC is also clear there is substantial boundary conditions that constrain, of course, the parameter set and the flexibility, which are given by the existing LHC infrastructure. And so there we make a machine design with constraints from LHC, civil engineering, and other things, and we use high luminosity LHC and FCC technologies to understand how such a machine could look like. So this was our technical content for the design study. Then we had to think, of course, also about the governance and organization of the study, since it should be an international collaboration. So on top of this... Uh, uh, organization chart here is the CERN Council that approves uh, the European strategy and this was the strategy up uh, date in 2013 that led to the creation of FCC study which is then implemented via the CERN DG of course and then below we set a structure that uh, takes into account the international nature of this collaboration so in the central part here is steering committee that uh, represents uh, the worldwide uh, nature of the, of the study and its organization. Um, and this steering committee interacts directly with the, let's say, the executive coordinating body in the study, which is the FCC study coordination team. And then we have uh, added, of course, a collaboration board that uh, is representing all the institutes that are member and collaborating to these activities. And uh, we have also added an advisory committee that would review this uh, study and the progress and uh, make recommendations in, in case changes or adjustments are needed. Now, I would like to take this occasion, of course, to thank these committees that have helped us a lot, first of all, in, in steering in the good direction and then in critically reviewing the study progress and of course also the collaboration board and the participating institutes for all the support and for all the resources that were flowing into this study. Now I took a slide that I found um, from the kickoff meeting in 2014 just to show you how we progressed. So this, this was our planning when we met uh, or when we started here in February in, in Geneva with the kickoff. We had this series of collaboration meetings that we wanted to hold, which turned afterwards into FCC weeks, where many of you were present. And already at that time, the goal was very clear. In the last uh, quarter of 2018, we should deliver CDRs, and we managed to, to match that goal and deliver these papers. Now, one more slide on the collaboration framework, since we also have uh, new members and we see a still a continuing interest in uh, joining the FCC study. So adopted to the early phase of this uh, design study, we have created a rather light collaboration framework that is based on a memorandum of understanding that defines a minimum set of uh, rules for this collaboration that allows us to, to work together in an effective way. And it's, of course, it's based on best effort from all the partners in this collaboration. It's open to, to academia and industry, it's self-governed. So it is a light framework that helped us to easily establish these uh, collaborations. 
and uh, with it comes specific addenda that allow us to be specific and to have specific agreement for sub-projects and studies with each individual partner. So this, I think, turned out extremely useful and necessary for this first phase. And then, of course, the collaboration grew and enabled us to do what we finally did, to write up four large uh, conceptual design reports. And this is the final uh, configuration of the FCC study. So I think we have 136 institutes, 32 companies were involved from 34 countries, support from the European Union. So this was, of course, providing the resources, this collaboration for the main work that happened. And then we got substantial support also from the European Union. Um, there are two programs that I want to mention here. One is the Eurocircle Design Study Program that uh, includes 15 European beneficiaries and uh, KK and also US partners, associated partners. And this block was established early in the study. It started in 2015 and it will finish by the end of this year. And with this program, we could substantially cover um, key work packages for a future hard-one collider from the optics via cryogenic beam vacuum system to the 16 Tesla magnet studies. So I think this was essential for progressing in these areas. Then later on, we were able to um, add a second program, this time a Marie Curie training network. And again, with this network, we are covering key areas for both machine studies. So for the Hadron study and for the Lepton study, in one case, or in both cases, it's uh, cryogenics and superconducting materials. And then there's a focus on RF structure production that is, of course, relevant for the lepton collider study. And there is another focus on uh, magnets, which is more, of course, towards the Hadron machine. So with this setup, we did our work and completed the work that has then resided in these four conceptual design reports, where you can see here the cover pages. These reports are in print at this very moment. And so we have four, four volumes. They were submitted to the European uh, Physical Journal. The physics summary of the FCC program, so is this uh, volume one, FCC Physics Opportunities. This goes into the EPGC. And the other three, the machine studies, are summarized as volumes under EPJ special topics. So there's one volume on the FCC EE one volume on the FCC HH, and the fourth volume uh, summarizing the high energy LHC. So these preprints are available since mid-January, and you can also order now paper copies of this report via this website, and we will have a short presentation of these CDRs uh, during the welcome event this evening. Now I want to underline how strong this collaboration grew over these uh, four, five years, since these CDRs carry more than 1,300 signatures of contributors from a total of more than 350 institutes. So I think it's really a truly global effort that we have made here. Then um, we have also provided input for the strategy update. There were four 10-page documents provided. You see here the cover pages plus their uh, addenda or appendices. And these four documents cover the FCC integral program, so the first step implementation of FCC EE, the lepton collider followed later on by 100 TV hadron machine as the integral program. And then there are individual documents as well that describe the lepton collider, the hadron collider, and the high energy LHC. Now I would like to show just a few slides uh, related to this integral program. So one is here that shows a little bit how this uh, infrastructure would integrate in the Geneva region. So the program itself is, of course, uh, starting with FCCE. This is the first generation Higgs factory, electroweak, and top factory at highest luminosities. And then, then step two, FCCHH at 100 TeV as a natural continuation at the energy frontier, of course, associated again, as I said already, with ion and EH options. Now, this 
these two phases are, of course, completely, uh, to some very large extent, complementary in physics. In this program, integrated is an ambitious high-field magnet R&D program that develops in parallel to the lepton collider construction and operation the uh, high-field magnets for a hadron collider. The program is, of course, based on common civil engineering and to large scale also common technical infrastructure. It builds on and it reuses CERN's existing infrastructure. And uh, as last point, but also very important, of course, we made sure that this program, this integrated project plan, is well integrated with CERN's present operation plan and with the upgrade of the LHC to the high luminosity LHC and with the high luminosity LHC exploitation. So here, a little more detail on the earliest steps that would be in such a program. This is, of course, civil construction and the connection to uh, electrical largest scale infrastructure. Some studies were done. We understand that uh, this um, civil infrastructure can be built in about seven years. The first sectors could become available for installation after about four and a half years, and the whole project could be completed within a time frame of around seven years. We also looked into the uh, connection to the European electricity grid, and also there there is a positive result coming out of this study that that's sufficient power can be supplied, even from different 400 kilovolt lines, in a reasonably well distributed uh, system to such a 100 kilometer tunnel that is indicated here. So there could be three feeding points. Then of course the layouts of the machines, without going here into any detail, are compliant in the sense that they can be um, realized in one and the same tunnel. There are two main IPs for both machines, which are in point A and uh, G, so opposite on the ring to guarantee highest luminosity and symmetric operation conditions. The footprint is common everywhere in the arcs, except for the lepton collider beam lines that deviate somewhat around the IP from the central line. As you can see here, this, this is done to limit the synchrotron radiation that is generated and sent towards the, towards the experiment. This is, of course, integrated in the tunnel studies and in the tunnel costing. This shows you the integration of the two machine concepts in the arc, in the, in the regular arc. Yeah? The tunnel is of diameter 5.5 meter to be compared to the LHC tunnel, which is 3.8 meter inner diameter. And uh, it has some additional features to the LHC, which is, for example, here a distribution of air in and here a smoke extraction that is fixed, built into this, um, into this infrastructure to comply with uh, present safety regulations and to have a straightforward system of, of tunnel ventilation in all construction and operation phases. And here you see the, the cuts. So this is the lepton collider with dual aperture magnets. This is the lepton full energy booster and this is the vehicle during the installation phase and there is some safety passage, etc. And similar here for the hard-on machine. You have the main machine magnet in position here in the middle with the two beam apertures. We have the cryogenic supply line next to it with the feeding points. And here you have the vehicle with the magnet indicating the installation phase. Now just two slides, one on the E, one on the AH, reminding you of the performance parameters. I have no parameter tables here on this one. For FCC, the goal is to reach absolutely highest luminosity. So here you see luminosity per IP for circular lepton colliders. And here you see center of mass energy. These are the four working points, set uh, W, X, and PT bar. So you can see the luminosity per IP goes from about 2, 10 to the 34 to the 10 to the 36 uh, range for the set. And uh, this is achieved by combining concepts, which I try to indicate here with these red uh, arrows, con uh, concepts that were developed on these different uh, circular lepton colliders and are then combined and applied to reach the very high performance that we have here. And this concept is double ring operation, of course. 
um, high beam current stop up injection, there's crepe waste optic to maximize luminosity, there's low vertical betas from lab time, high energy operation aspect, synchrotron radiation effects, and there's of course also important for this precision physics, the energy calibration and the positron source. So all these concepts are somehow proven. We are confident that by using these com concepts and by combining the machine on these kind of technologies, there is of course a high level of confidence that such a machine can be built with minimum risk and will reach the design performance in a short period of time after startup. And this slide here indicates a little bit the story on the Hadron machine side. Here see some past Hadron colliders where we take the Tevatron. From the Tevatron we had a significant jump when we went to the LHC. And this was uh, typically nearly an order of magnitude in, in, in luminosity and in collision energy. In fact, the seven here from the Tevatron to the LHC, and we are aiming at a similarly large step, so an order of magnitude in energy, an order of magnitude in luminosity, when going from the LHC uh, to the FCC HH. So it's this increase that is shown here, and this brings us to the 100 TV and to the design goal of 20 inverse autobahn collected per experiment. Um, over about 25 years of operation. Key technology for the, for the FCC HH is of course the high field magnet program and here I put some pictures. We go in fact from the 8.3 Tesla Niobium Titanium technology that we developed for the LHC. Wire, a first step is now the high luminosity LHC upgrade where we have 11 Tesla uh, dipole magnets and 12 or 12 and a half Tesla peak field quadrupole magnets in Niobium 13 technology. So this is the first step of using this technology in accelerators. And we go towards uh, 16 Tesla Niobium 13 technology or alternative technologies. And the first step here was uh, enabled by the European Horizon uh, 2020 Euro Circle study. These, these designs were developed in there. Uh, in addition, uh, there was a Swiss support program and there's the US magnet development program that is also working on this. So here now, a schedule of this integrated uh, program. Um, you can see here on top running year numbers from a T0, which you can make, for example, 2020 to, to look through easier. If you put here 2020, the, the next line corresponds to the present uh, LH, high luminosity LHC exploitation plan that brings the LHC uh, end of operation somewhere in the late 2030s, 37, 38. And this would be the point in time where new infrastructure should become available. So to do this, we assume here that the FCC EE project is uh, fully supported by the strategy and by the, uh, by the CERN Council. And if this is the case, then the first step would be a project preparation, administrative processes, funding, uh, etc which was already mentioned. This would be a phase that takes five to six years, typically. In parallel, also some geological investigations of the ground to understand the conditions and to be able to do a tender planning for the civil construction. Uh, after five, six years, this uh, could result in a definitive project decision at the time of the next update of the European strategy, somewhere 25, 26. And that could then launch uh, the civil engineering activity with the permissions and with the tendering of the contracts and then uh, result in the construction of the tunnel until the mid 30s. And in parallel, of course, accelerator and uh, detector development programs, prototyping, construction of components and then somewhere from the mid 30s on accelerator installation commissioning in such a way that this uh, new infrastructure would become available typically by 2040 as desired from the overall landscape. And then there's a certain operation phase uh, during which uh, preparations for the Hadron machine would, uh, would come in place. Um, this is again update of permissions, of getting together funding agreements, etc completing the technical design work for machine and uh, detector and starting already the production of the dipole magnets in such a way that once the one machine stops operating, the construction of dipole magnets is already in full swing and ongoing yeah, to avoid any bad surprises or these kind of things. 
and then a changeover period of, let's say, up to 10 years, and then uh, following that one operation of the Hadron machine. Now, um, this is the cost estimate that goes with these uh, machines. So the phase one, which is the full program of the, of the Lepton Collider, is estimated to be around 11 and a half billion Swiss franc, where uh, the civil infrastructure is 5.4, 2.2 for the technical infrastructure, and 4 billion for the accelerator in the injector. And the phase two if, um, is based on the fact that, of course, infrastructure and so is already existing. Construction phase complete cost is about 17 billion. The largest part here is now for the accelerator, and out of these 13.6 billion, again, the largest part, 9.4 billion, is dedicated to these uh, challenging dipole ma magnets. Afterwards, there are some smaller, some smaller investments to upgrade or to adapt the civil engineering infrastructure, and a larger investment on the technical infrastructure, which is mainly driven by the cryogenics. So, to enable all these, we have started uh, already to work with uh, host states in both uh, France and Switzerland with uh, the relevant bodies at regional uh, level in France and at the uh, Federation, Canton and State of Geneva and uh, federal level in, in Switzerland to create an, 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 a common understanding. And uh, as an outcome of these activities, there are some reports, and uh, in there we have uh, defined or identified administrative processes that will be necessary to be implemented, to go ahead, such as urbanistic, environmental, economic impact, and so on. And these things are, of course, still ongoing. Now, two slides on, on, on other lines. This is the conclusion from the high energy LHC studies. So I just point you to this integration drawing that uses the same technology that we have developed for the Hadron machine, FCCHH, and you can see clearly that this is extremely limited to be installed in the LHC tunnel. Um, so it's clear from, from our studies that it will be very challenging to put this kind of technology in, inside the existing uh, tunnel uh, constraints and dimensions. Also, due to the higher operating field, higher synchrotron radiation, much more challenging beam parameters, um, the cryogenic system needs substantial upgrades, so there are two major uh, blocks that need to be solved uh, for the high energy LHC uh, option. And then I would like to make you aware of one, of one, of one uh, study, or one request that came up during the European strategy uh, discussions. There is an ESG request uh, that we received uh, after the Granada, after the discussions in the Granada meeting to um, develop a parameter set for a lower energy hard-on collider using this uh, 100 kilometer tunnel. And we have had uh, some uh, iterations on this to quickly give the strategy group input on how such a machine could look like, what its performance would be, and what its technology requirements and cost would be. So this is presently ongoing. We're trying to produce such a short document to inform the ESG. As you can see here, collision energy is somewhat below 40 TeV. Um, dipole field is considered a, a single layer, simple magnet based on niobium titanium technology. Um, there's of course far less synchrotron radiation, peak luminosity like for the high energy LHC uh, with 110 to the 35 levels such that uh, you can collect about 0 0.5 inverse autobahn per year with such a machine, or about 10 inverse autobahn in a period of 20 years. So this is ongoing and will be given to the strategy group. Now I come to the next steps to uh, finish this presentation. Actually, what is ongoing at the moment is iteration of tunnel and surface structures, layout and implementation discussion with the host states. Of course, linked uh, to these kind of activities, we need to adapt the CE planning, we need to slightly adapt the machine designs according to this optimization process that, uh, of course, has an impact on, on all fronts. Now, uh, following, of course, also the, the fact that we have proposed this integral project uh, to the strategy group, we are at this moment focusing on bringing 
the FCCEE as a potential first step to some advanced studies in, in specific areas that were not touched too much in detail in the uh, previous phase. And this is in particular we are reviewing and working out a more detailed design for the injector concept. And we are also looking in somewhat more detail into the technical infrastructure design for EE. And the uh, third large point that we are following at this moment is we are preparing a new proposal for an EU H2020 design study project in the last InfraDev call now for November 2019 that is focusing on preparations for infrastructure implementation. Now this is here, I will not go now into the details of this program. There are a certain number of, of key words that are inside the call that you see here, site selection, resources and environment, governance, organization, construction, operation, scientific user collaboration, coherently integrate this infrastructure in Europe. So these are key words. And of course, we are presently with the strategy update, with these discussions, with the whole program, we can address all this in a very elegant way. So we have many topics that we are looking at and that automatically very well fit this program. So. And then in the longer term, uh, from 2020 to 26, so for the, let's say the period up to the next strategy update, if there is a support by EPPSU and uh, the CERN Council, one would work towards project preparatory activities with host states, so the real identification of land plots, acquisition plans, sector plans, environmental impact assessment, the public and all these uh, aspects. Uh, civil engineering site investigations to have a definitive understanding of the ground conditions which are needed to do the, the tender planning and to minimize the risk in terms of construction and of course also an associated cost. This could be accompanied by uh, technical design towards CDR++ or TDRs for the accelerators or technology and technical infrastructures that are compatible with this 100 TV infrastructure. And of course, development of finance, governance models for project operation, looking into in-kind uh, strategies. And this, of course, is more on the, on the CERN Council and Directorate side. And of course, all these four activities would then need to come to a positive conclusion by 25, 26 as an ingredient to take a definitive decision on the project. So this brings me to the conclusions and outlook. So as recommended by the ESU 2030, the study was organized as an international collaboration focused on the conceptual design of high performance energy frontier circular colliders for the post LHC era. First phase is completed. We have developed machine designs that are compatible with the requirements that were formulated on the physics side, which are all documented in these four CDRs. With it, we have developed a concrete implementation proposal, which is the integral uh, plan that has been submitted to the ESU. And the next steps, of course, are, in, are to be seen in, in, in depending on the progress and on the recommendations that come out of the ESU to continue these activities in the way I just described. So, uh, the purpose now for me for this week is of course we want to give you again a platform and uh, stimulate exchange between all participants across the different study areas. We want to strengthen our collaboration and strengthen this network and, and enlarge it. And I think we should develop plans for the upcoming study phase while uh, watching and uh, waiting for the EPPSU uh, recommendations. So I wish you all a very nice and productive week. Thank you very much for your help and for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for this very nice talk about the amazing work done by everybody to reach this level of, uh, of precision and uh, uh, clear vision for the future. So we have time for maybe one or two questions before the break. Some clarification needed or any point? I think uh, as a participant to a CC study, I'd like to thank Michael for the fantastic job he's done leading this effort. Yeah, we can give a big applause. <laughs> if there is no other question, and 
we can move to the to the coffee break and resume in uh, less than half an hour at 11 sharp.